Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Canadian Thanksgiving. Surely is a holiday that brings a whole family to the table. And as it is fall, it is election season. And uh, turkey and tofurkey isn't the only thing on the table. We also have polarizing debates. The divisive issues of the past year, the possibility of coming up at family gatherings this time of year. And with the sunlight going away, temperaments aren't as relaxed as the summertime. And in these times of discussion and debate, things can get ugly. And so, of course, there's plenty of advice online about how to dialogue across the Thanksgiving table to avoid food fights and tables being flipped. After all, the uh, popular origin story of Thanksgiving, that is of course, historically debated, is all about generosity and reconciliation. In the Corinthian church, there was a disagreement about the members of, among the members of the church family. I don't know if any food was thrown, but it did get pretty messy, and people were taking up sides on all kinds of the sides of the issue. Chapter 8 opens up with a question about an issue that caused quite a bit of division in the church of Corinth. What do we do about food that is sacrificed to idols? Can we eat it? Is it still good? To put things in context, in Paul's day, there was a lot of idol worship. Today, when we talk about worshiping idols, we mean things that we prioritize before God in our life. That's how we keep this word idol relevant today, when actual idol worship is not mainstream or a huge temptation for most of us. For the early church, worshiping idols meant legit idols, statues that animals were sacrificed in front of. And after the animals were sacrificed, there were feasts with, where the meat was eaten and all kinds of other ungodly behavior was taking place. Heavy drinking, prostitution, sexual morality. We don't have a problem with idols today. No. For the Christian that had grown up and that was Jewish, resisting idols was a no-brainer. It's one of those Ten Commandments that was etched in stone by Moses. Do not worship idols. You shall have no other god before me. And the Israelites got the message. Okay, I guess there was a few slip-ups. <laughs> anyway, the basic thesis of their recorded history, First and Second Kings, and the prophets were describing what beyond horrible disasters happened and will happen if you start worshiping idols instead of God. The writers didn't mind belaboring the point. Just read the book of Jeremiah. By the time we get to the first century, no Jewish person worth their salt disagree about whether they should or shouldn't worship idols. All the ones that thought that they should had unfortunately long gone into Assyrian exile. However, there was a confusion about what Christians should do in the Corinthian church with meat that had been sacrificed to idols. Do we eat it or not? Now, we have to understand that in Corinth, like other Greek and Roman cities, a lot of the meat produced was sacrificed to idols in the morning. And then the, it was the leftovers that were later sold in the marketplace that, while well, it was still good and fresh. So yeah, the meat was there for the buying and it was nice and cheap. Mouth watering, maybe even. And I get this, whenever I see a deal on cheap meat, I don't let that opportunity pass me by. I used to work with someone, and if he saw a good deal on meat at the grocery store, he would text me immediately. He'd say, get your butt down to Zayers, pork shoulders on for $1.99 a pound. You've got to get that stuff. And as it happens, I'm not eating turkey this weekend, but you can bet that this week I'm buying a fresh turkey when it goes sale 30% off. <laughs> All right? Just as the same it is today, meat is expensive. We eat a lot of vegetarian dishes at our house because of this, and it was probably expensive back in those days in, in Corinth. So it makes sense that many, of the, uh, that many of the church members didn't bat an eyelash about eating meat when it came to them. And, and you know, maybe it had been on an, an idol altar, maybe it hadn't. We don't know. Besides, hadn't the law been abolished? Weren't Christians free to eat whatever and with whomever they liked? Well, some of the members of the church didn't see it that way. They believed that eating the meat sacrificed to idols was just the same as participating in idol worship. 
So there was a disagreement between those two groups of people. And it wasn't just, I guess I'm going to skip going over to Bob and Joe's house after church because they are serving meat. Shared tables and eating together was very much a part of the early church rhythm of life. This disagreement got, caused quite a stir. Things got messy. They got real, as they say. Enough so that word got out to Paul, and he had to step in to referee the situation by including it in his letter. And in response to this disagreement of idol, idol worship and, and meat, Paul established first in chapter 8, verse 4 to 6, that idols do not have any true power, and that there's just one true God who is Jesus Christ our Lord. So what power do idols have? In our imagination. And in verse 7, Paul admits that some new Christians are still coming to terms with this new reality of God being the true God. So for these new Christians, eating food sacrificed to idols was part of a ritual that still had power because of that imagination that they still held. Now you have to consider that just as we have communion with bread and wine, there was a pagan ritual that was similar, analog, to that one, which also had powerful symbolic meaning for the pagan worshiper. This makes sense. Some branches of Christianity still have such reverence for the holy power of blessed food itself that the priest must consume all of the communion elements. So for these new believers and the people in relation to them, Paul says it's wise to stay away from the meat, especially the meat that has clearly had the taint of idol worship. Like, for instance, being in the temple and someone saying, hey, take this choice piece of meat directly from an idol of an altar, altar idol. So eating a piece of meat from an, 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 an altar that's been, you know, right in front of the idol is fundamentally different than picking up some cheap meat that's been on sale in the marketplace. Meat which may or may not have been left over from an idol sacrifice early in the morning. It's not just a matter of willful ignorance. As Paul wrote, there is just one true God. And therefore, the sacrifice food itself doesn't have any magic power. It's the symbolism created by the sacrifice ritual that forms the person's imagination that has the power. It's the food and, and the drink that's consumed together which defines allegiance to a group and its beliefs which has power. So if you aren't taking part of those rituals and some cheap meat comes your way, go for it. I personally enjoy Paul's nuanced argument here. In this case of the meat on sale in the marketplace, it's okay. In the case of eating meat during a ritual to an idol, it's not. But there's one more case for Paul's nuanced argument, one more thing that he wants them to be careful of. Paul tells the Corinthians to be mindful of others in what might be a stumbling block to their new developing faith. So, for their sake, Paul offers never to eat meat again to prevent them from going back to idol worship. So Paul's argument is self-giving in deference and nuance to specific contexts. That's different from a lot we hear today, which is these black and white perspectives that are easy to understand, but easy to grandstand, but lack taking account of small but important details. And maybe, you know, this black and white thinking is ha going to happen around the Thanksgiving table, this, this, coming, uh, this coming meal. Maybe you're one of those people. <laughs> we're, we're all like that a bit sometimes. Paying attention to nuance is hard, but important if we want to make the right and wise decision. And this is what Paul did when he examined this disagreement in the church over eating idol meat. He acknowledged that both sides of the argument— and then explained when it's appropriate to eat it and when it would be harmful to another person's new faith. So let's take Paul's example, his way of thinking, and make a nuanced decision about something that we encounter today that Christians talk about. Alcohol. When should Christians enjoy their liberty and drink alcohol? Or should Christians abstain from partaking in this vice? Now, alcohol is one of the oldest psychoactive drugs consumed by humanity. According to Wikipedia, among other effects, alcohol produces happiness, euphoria, 
decreased anxiety, increased sociability, sedation, impairment of cognitive uh, memory, motor, sensory function, generalized depression of central nervous system function. It's addicted to humans, but can result in alcohol use disorder, dependence, and withdrawal. It have a long term uh, adverse effect on health, liver damage, brain damage, consumption is the, the fifth leading card, cause of cancer. 2002 study found that 41% people fatally injured in fatal traffic accidents were alcohol-related crashes. 40% of all assaults, 40 to 50% of all murders involve alcohol. More than 43% of all violent encounters with police involve alcohol. Alcohol is implemented in more than two-thirds of cases of intimate partner violence. Doesn't sound too good, does it? Well, sociologically, there's a lot of data that shows the risks involved with the abuse of alcohol. And part of the high rates cited in this article are because, of course, alcohol's prevalent use in our culture and around the world. Alcohol is unquestionably a big part of our culture for celebration, as it is the social lubricant for gatherings. And probably for a lot of you, and for you know, myself included, there will be wine served during Thanksgiving. There is a long rich tradition of food and drink that contain alcohol that have created many recipes that have complex flavors, and some go very well with turkey. Some people find that these drinks are very delicious and nourishing. And, I'll have a personal little example of this, alcohol beverages can be a kind of medicine and save you from food poisoning. In a banquet where bad food was, was served, it was found that those who drank spirits and wine did not suffer from the food poisoning. I thought to look this up one summer evening after I ate some questionable chicken at a downtown music festival, and I happened to have a little bit of wine in the cupboard, and yeah, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so what's in the Bible about drinking alcoholic beverages? Of course, we're, we need to turn to the Bible. In a nutshell, some alcohol is okay, becoming drunk is not. <laughs> in the Bible, there are passages that praise the wine for making the heart glad. So... And wine makes the glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthens the man's heart. Psalm 104, verse 15. There are other passages, and then there's Ecclesiastes 9, verse 7, that makes this connection between wine and, and gladness. There's also examples of people who are made a mockery of because of their excess drinking and drunkenness. So we find in the early Christian tradition, that's important to, to know as well, that some early writers like Clement of Alexandria caution believers, in fact, to water down their wine to avoid the temptation of becoming drunk. And later, much later, the actual wholesale prohibition of alcohol by Christians doesn't happen until the 19th and 20th century. And it's promoted by men and women societies, women who are just tired of their drunken husbands. So Dr. Bradley Knoll um, is, a, is, a, is a former uh, Pentecostal colleague of Shane's, who unfortunately very sadly died not too long ago, argues in his book, uh, Tinder, Tattoos, and Tequila, that both a sensitivity to the leading of the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and the regard for the spiritual health of others must be the two central things in the consumption of alcohol for Christians. And he summarizes Paul's nuanced argument for the need for the care and concern for others with the phrase, love over liberty, or love before liberty. And like the new believers in Paul's church who used to worship idols, alcohol and other psychoactive drugs are often a core part of an old way of life for people. And many in our culture, getting drunk, unfortunately, is just viewed as a fun way of spending a weekend or a day off, never mind the damage that it may do. So according to Paul and Dr. Knoll, if drinking alcohol could influence someone who has a problem with alcohol, to go back to an older lifestyle of drinking and partying, it's just not worth it. And this is really a very, uh, <laughs> these memes, some of them are just going to be way over the top of your head. I'm doing for the online crowd here. They're going to be able to pause it on YouTube and uh, look at those. So if you are interested to see what I'm saying, you might want to watch it again on YouTube and just like go through and pause the different. Anyway, anyway so um, as, as it's best to avoid, Dr. Noel wrote Love Before Liberty. Another writer, Dr. Timothy Keller, who remarked that Paul's argument to put love before liberty is very countercultural today. Because in North America, of course, what you hear most of the time is personal liberty all the way, rah, 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 do what you want. It's your, it's your decision. So to give up rights to do something because of love 
for another. Now that's remarkable. That's countercultural, and it's hard. However, what if, what if the presence of a moderately consumed alcoholic beverage could be used in a certain situation to welcome people to faith? What if? In 1981, two Catholic priests in Illinois, John Cusick and Jack Wall, decided to try something different. They organized a six-week summer program for young adults called Theology on Tap, in which beer was served during a presentation of, of topics on Christian faith, topics with titles like, Who's Your Daddy? Meeting My Real Father. It was popular. Oh, sorry, I'm lost here. <laughs> when, when young adults were asked what they enjoyed, it was the community that was created through these casual conversations in the parish hall before and after the talk. So Theology on Tap was copied in many countries like ours, Canada, Great Britain, Hong Kong, and other countries around the world. Now, I could be wrong, but I'm going to bet that no one going to Theology on Tap at the parish hall woke up the next morning with a hangover. The entire culture in which the alcohol was served was different, especially when Father Cusack is at the ta taps. Just like with the meat, it's not the meat itself that's the problem, it's the ritual of idol worship around the eating of meat. And so too with alcohol use. If you're going to a field party or a rowdy bar where people are abusing alcohol and laughing about people getting drunk, then yes, drinking is going to be a problem. If you go to a responsible bar that actually enforces smart serve regulations, it won't. If you're going to be joining with friends and families and having a, a glass of wine over dinner, that's probably a different story than something like a, a rambunctious party where uh, you know, people are doing keg stands. Now, there could be all kinds of things that, that Paul's nuance arm, uh, sorry, there could be all kinds of ways that we can use this thinking from Paul to apply to situations where we should or shouldn't do something. And one of the key insights that Paul offers is that it's the weaker person's faith that we should be concerned with. Now, too often in the church, we get the other way around, where it's the older, strong person in the faith that just dislikes and is offended by something, so we just shouldn't do it. Not because it's wrong, because they just don't like it. And if we have a freedom to try new things, like hypothetically theology on tap, for instance, which I'm not proposing, but, but if we wanted to try something different, we should apply this, this paradigm thinking that Paul is, is, is encouraging us to do about idol meat. And, and that being said, with our freedom, we should always put love before liberty. We should always put love before liberty and have a special concern for those, for, in the case of alcohol, for those that have suffered from alcoholism. People that have suffered from alcoholism, they need sober spaces where they can develop healthy relationships. And the church may be one of those few sober social spaces that is available to them. So it's not easy making a decision about what we serve and what we eat and drink. Learning from Paul in this chapter, we need to be leaning on the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and attentive to the nuance of each and every situation and who is in the room each and every time. So, let's close together in prayer. God, help us to be wise in all things that we eat and drink. Help us to be a church that welcomes others and deferentially gives up our own freedom and preference for the love of others. Help us to show the world how beautiful your gospel message is. Lead us, Holy Spirit, and give us insight about all matters of our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for your death that covered all of our mistakes that we could inevitably make stumbling in these areas. Keep us leaning into you, placing our trust in you, and putting all of our hope in you. We love you, God, for everything you have done and will do. Amen.